Hi, folks. Um, my name is Arthur Anderson from the, the University of New England. Um, joining you here from home and in dire need of a haircut, but excited nonetheless to be virtually participating in these activities at the Brickstore Museum. Um, so I'm here to talk a little bit about the 16th century uh, from my perspective as an archaeologist and, and as a prehistoric archaeologist and uh, indeed a proto-historic archaeologist, as we call those of us that study this, this transition from prehistoric to historic periods and, and kind of the foundation of um, the world as we understand it today in many ways. Um, the 16th century is really tricky to study for archaeologists. Um, in our terms, you know, the, that century is a pretty short span of time to try to narrow in on in the ground for a, a bunch of technical reasons. But it's hugely important to study as well. Uh, it's one of the uh, most important, but one of the least understood um, periods uh, here in New England. And uh, it's really one that, that formed the, the, the really often tragic foundations of the world that we inhabit today. Um, 16th century was the first time that the, the people of the Dawnland, the Wabanaki people that have uh, called this part of the world home since at least the last ice age for many, many thousands of years, encountered European colonizers and explorers and, and began sustained relationships with them, um, which would you know, lay the foundations or begin to lay the foundations at least for the genocide, wars, disease, colonialism, et cetera, that would, that would follow in the 17th century uh, through to effectively the present. Um, from the perspective of um, a prehistorian, we talk about this as the late woodland period in terms of our large scale uh, chronological organization of the last 12,000 years or so. Um, the last 3,000 years or so are what we consider the uh, woodland period. Uh, there are a number of sort of characteristics of this. Um, a, a really important one that we'll return to is, is the idea that this was a very busy sort of vibrant period we, we suspect we see populations increasing um, we see vast networks of, of trade spanning uh, really the entire north american continent we see a lot of, of material moving around and being traded as archaeologists we can pin down that material we can understand that better that material culture that we can dig out of the ground um, but if this material is moving um, there must also be people, ideas, traditions, all of these other things, um, intangible things moving around. Um, so archaeologists talk a lot about the idea of intensification. It's a little bit of a vague word, but in, in which we mean these, these contacts, these rising populations, these large scale social and economic networks. Um, and we also see new technology around this time. Uh, the birch bark canoe is uh, enormously important in terms of opening up um, inland waterways uh, in, in different ways from previous technology and, and so enabling uh, travel and exchange and all sorts of things. Um, we also see it at various times and places and, and not at all times and places, uh, the introduction of, of horticulture, the growing of uh, corn, beans and squash uh, and then more sedentary populations. Uh, potentially living in, in village-like arrangements and uh, things like this. Um, so this is kind of the, this is the state of play. This is the, the world um, into which uh, Europeans come for the first time. And this is sort of the state of play, say, around 1450. And then changes start to happen very, very, very quickly um, to the extent that in, in this part of the world, um, the Wabanaki and other indigenous populations had been reduced by as much as 90% um, by 1620 or so, the early part of the 17th century, um, due to disease, due to war, due to outright genocide, due to so many other things. So we're looking at this, this very short period um, that laid the foundation for the, the structure of the world that, that we live in today. Um, and, and that's why it's tremendously important to talk about. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, sort of how archaeology proceeds and use the example of a site that I'm working on, uh, on Saco Bay. And, uh, we'll see if I can do all this screen sharing uh, effectively and efficiently. So we're looking at a site at the mouth of the Saco on the University of New England campus. And this is a broad timeline. You can see there at the end, the, the woodland period, as we call it. Um, we have occupation in the site stretching well back into the archaic period. We certainly have occupation in York County uh, stretching back to nearly 13,000 years ago. So uh, a tremendous time depth of occupation on this landscape. Um, the site that I'll be talking about today is, is really just a, an area where we have really good archeological preservation of activity in the last uh, few thousand years. 
uh, and that's chiefly focused on the woodland period, but archaic remains have certainly been found uh, nearby. One of the reasons this site is, is well known and, and talked about uh, is that the, the Samuel Champlain uh, stopped off uh, in 1605 uh, and recorded his observations of, of uh, people and encounters he had at a, a village or at a river that, that he recorded the name of as Chuakoa, the Saco River today. Uh, and he provided us with this um, nautical chart, which, which gives uh, a lot of detail um, about the seas, about anchorages and about islands and things like that and a little more vague detail about the types of landscapes uh, and, and the architecture and organization that, that he was seeing uh, inland. So we have this, this record of, of Champlain visiting this well-established, long-occupied uh, village site in 1605 and, and giving us some sort of description uh, of what is going on there. Um, and, and one of the interesting things about working in this period is really trying to balance the, the European uh, descriptions and often uh, misunderstandings um, of what they were encountering and what they were seeing with what the archeological record tells us about the life ways of the Wabanaki people that they were uh, encountering. Um, so this is one of those things that makes this really interesting and, and I think sometimes highlights the degree to which we prioritize um, often vague or erroneous uh, European written records over uh, the direct evidence that we have of Wabanaki lifeways. Um, it's important to remember that, that Champlain and his expedition were, um, to, to some degree, they were, they were lost and scared. They had just survived the uh, winter by the grace of the Passamaquoddy people up on St. Croix Island um, and were, were making their way south um, in a very, you know, into the unknown. Um, so it's, that's an important lens, I think, with which to look at Champlain's accounts. So uh, I've been conducting excavations here since 2017, uh, peeling back the layers and uh, trying to recover artifacts and understand their relationships and their, their, context, uh, their context and uh, sort of piece together the story of what's been going on here. Uh, and I'm, I'm far from the first archeologist to, to work at the site. We have uh, a lot of archeological material uh, coming from this area. And this is the sort of stuff that, that we get sort of straight out of the field, you know, a mix of different types of artifacts, um, which I'll, I'll go on to talk about. But, um, but it's a lot of material that we need to get out of the ground and keep contextualized so that we understand not just the stuff itself, but, but the relationships, what's found with it, what's found above it and below it and around it. And that's how we, we piece together um, action from artifacts, how we piece together human action from, from stuff. Um, one exciting category that we have a lot of at this particular site is ceramics. Um, this is another introduction, uh, another technology introduced in the woodland period. Um, and we see different uh, forms of ceramics, sizes of ceramics, decorations on ceramics changing through time. Uh, so these can be great chronological indicators and they can tell us a lot about what people are doing and cooking and eating. Um, in particular, uh, we are looking forward to being able to analyze some burnt remains, essentially some burnt food that's still crusted onto these ceramics. Uh, and with, with uh, analysis, we can determine uh, what types of animals, some of the fats that remain uh, within the structure of the ceramics might have come from. Um, we can get radiocarbon dates off of burnt food and things like that. So uh, analysis is just beginning, but we have a large and, and interesting ceramic assemblage, including like this, some, some really big pieces. This is from the rim of a big decorated cooking pot. Um, and that's got some wonderful food residue burnt onto the inside that we're um, excited to, to look at. Another major category um, is stone tools. Uh, so these, these here are, are the, the remains, the leftovers, if you will, um, from, from making stone tools. Um, I'm going to talk about, a little bit about that process. Um, the, uh, the key to making a stone tool is that you're, you're breaking certain types of rocks that can be flaked or broken in a, a predictable fashion so that you can have control over how you're shaping them by, by breaking these bits of sharp rock. Um, so I don't want to make a mess, but, but an example um, would be this piece of chert, when, when carefully struck at the right angle with sufficient force, will split off a big sharp flake like this. Um, and by controlling the size and the location of these flakes, one can shape the original rock into a, a sort of stone tool. Um, and we can, we can see where these fit back together. Now, a flake like this, 
um, is certainly a useful sharp flake on its own and could be made into any number of other tools in, in the process. Um, but this sort of works down to smaller and smaller levels. So we have examples of, of large scale flaking like that, um, but we see the same results on uh, projectile points and tools and things like that. So if I, I see if I can do this again here. So I want to have a look under a microscope at this piece here, which is the broken off tip of a projectile point. And in this, you can see at the very smallest level where flakes were removed, um, flakes that would have been uh, far too tiny to make other tools out of. Um, but you can see the pattern of breakage uh, and the material that would have been left behind from, from making this. Uh, this is out of uh, an Onondaga church from Western New York. And we'll talk about trade networks as well in a moment. So back to looking at our assemblage of artifacts um, from the site at the mouth of the Saco. Uh, these are examples of little waste flakes left over from making those stone tools that, that wouldn't have been able to be made into tools themselves and, and would have been discarded, but they still have a lot to tell us about the types of tools people were making, the activities that people were engaging in. Um, it's also important to look at where these stones came from. And that gets back to our idea that in the late woodland, we see these really broad networks of trade. Um, in looking both microscopically and macroscopically and chemically at these stones, we can reconstruct some of those trade networks really effectively. Um, this is a rhyolite that's probably coming from uh, somewhere in the Boston basin, I'm still, still tracking that down precisely. Um, we have wonderful examples of things like uh, crystal quartz, which is probably being traded down the Saco from sources even in the White Mountains. Uh, this is a broken projectile point made of a really distinctive banded rhyolite. You can see the sort of swirls in it there. It's a volcanic stone. Um, and this comes pretty specifically from Vinyl Haven. So uh, we see contacts across the region and even beyond. This is just a, a, a tiny piece. I promise it's more distinctive looking in person. Um, but this is a, a quartzite that is found in northern Labrador. Um, so we are, we're looking at hundreds or thousands of miles um, that the stone is traveling to reach this site that's really at the center of these broad trade networks. Um, with the exclusion of Labrador to keep the scale of the map sensible. Um, this is a map of all the sources of stone uh, that we find at the site, which is, which is a little star there. Um, and it's close enough to the Brickstore Museum that the, the star I think counts for that as well uh, at this scale. So we have material coming from uh, Pennsylvania, from New York, from Northern Maine, from Nova Scotia, from all over the place. And once again, if, if this material is traveling, if stuff is traveling, think of the intangibles that uh, are traveling throughout these enormous social and economic networks. In the broken projectile points and things like that that we find, we also get you know, some hints of, of what people were doing and where influences were coming from. Um, the example on the left there is just the stem or the base of a projectile point that may be one of the oldest we've seen on the site so far. Uh, it's a little bit hard to tell because it's broken, but that might date to the archaic period. Um, to the right, we have a, a style of projectile point known as a Fox Creek style of projectile point that's pretty rare as you go further up the coast in Maine, but a lot more common around Massachusetts. So this can tell us something about cultural uh, connections. It's interesting to note some patterns that we see in the stone tools that can tell us a little bit about what people were doing in the area of this prehistoric landscape that we are able to look at because of good archaeological preservation. Uh, one thing you might have noticed is that all the projectile points I've been showing you have been broken. Um, and this seems to be one that uh, snapped off uh, while it was in an arrow or a spear shaft. And that's a pretty common occurrence on the site. Uh, so this suggests that we are looking at this sort of waterfront area where people might be uh, returning to the site from hunting expeditions and things like that and repairing and reworking uh, tools and disposing of broken tools. So a lot of these probably were thrown away because they were broken. And in the evidence that we have of the chips left behind on the site, you know, we don't, we don't see big pieces like this from the production of stone tools. We see tiny little pieces left over from the reworking and the resharpening and things like that of stone tools. So it gives us a sense of what people were doing in this part of the landscape. And it's a really interesting activity area to look at because we're looking at these sort of interfaces and intersections 
um, between the landscapes and the seascapes and the river uh, and different ecosystems and different ways in which um, humans were interacting with those. Um, further examples here of broken projectile points uh, and also this one on the left, which has just been resharpened and reworked uh, until there wasn't much left. And at that point it was, it was disposed of. Um, we also have other types of tool. This is a, a, a type of tool that's very common on uh, habitation sites and living areas in the late woodland. Uh, we call a thumbnail scraper, um, just a, a tiny little flake that's been uh, shaped and as we'd say retouched and is probably used for uh, the preparation of leather and scraping fat and uh, hair and things off of hides. Um, these are very common on many late woodland sites, and these are remarkably uncommon in the area that we're looking at. So again, that suggests that we're not looking at sort of domestic tasks. We're looking at, at maybe an activity area uh, where people are processing animals and repairing stone tools. Um, and those animals are a really interesting thing to look at, a really wonderful opportunity on this site, again, to look at people's interaction with prehistoric Saco Bay. Um, so what we have here, uh, is a little fragment of a uh, shark's tooth uh, and another little fragment of, of sturgeon scoot, the, the big bony plates uh, on a sturgeon, which we'll talk about more in a moment. Um, these are, are neat examples of the, the types of animals that people were harvesting from Saco Bay, um, but they are also pretty remarkable in terms of preservation. You know, we get the tooth enamel and a little bit of burnt sturgeon scoot that survive in the really acidic soils that we have here in New England. But we're lucky that in many parts of this site, um, many may be familiar with a shell midden, in many parts of this site, we have these small areas where enough clam shell has been deposited from people eating clams that it's changed the soil chemistry. And in those areas, um, we get much better preservation. Uh, so we get these big fragments. Again, this is a fragment of sturgeon scoot, these giant prehistoric fish that are covered in, in bony plates um, that, that we still see in the Saco today. Uh, so wonderful preservation of these big chunks of sturgeon scoot. And this again suggests, you know, you, you've got to get a lot of scoots off a of sturgeon before you can eat it. Um, so we see a lot of sturgeon scoot being deposited in this area. Again, that might be initial preparation of, of the catch or the kill before uh, it gets transported back to be cooked and, and eaten. We have other examples like a, a bird bone. So there's the really interesting um, analysis uh, that we're in the process of doing of what kinds of species we see here and what kinds of ecosystems they represent. Uh, so this is in some ways through the remains of food that was eaten at the site. Uh, we can look back on what was going on in the, in the river, in the bay, and the forests around this area uh, thousands of years ago. We even have examples uh, of now extinct creatures like sea mink and gray auk, whose remains have been recovered from the site. So there's a lot of ecological data um, on these archaeological sites as well that are really important. Um, one thing that has proved sort of elusive as we think about um, changes in diet and, and things like new uh, technologies in the late woodland period um, is evidence of horticulture. Uh, and, and we have these depictions of fields and, and written depictions of growing corn, beans, and squash, squash from Champlain. Um, we don't yet have direct evidence of that on, uh, on this site, though it is, uh, you know, burnt kernels of maize and things like that do come from other sites further up the Saco River. Um, so that's something that we're, we're focusing on um, in, in future excavations and, and seeing what we can recover in terms of botanical data that might tell us more about not just the animals, but the, the plants and, and how those ecosystems were changing with the introduction of uh, horticulture. So that's a little bit of insight into um, the late woodland period from a perspective of a prehistoric archaeologist and, and this very late period and things like the arrival of, of uh, Champlain and, and other Europeans um, have spurred archaeologists to seek in the record, seek in the archaeological record, this sort of moment of contact. And that's proved uh, pretty elusive. 
Um, and, and I would say that part of that is this idea of a moment of contact and a moment that changed everything is sort of accepting the idea of, of an inevitability that Wapanaki people would be overwhelmed by these new technologies, materials, these newcomers. Um, and in my investigations of and thinking about the 16th and 17th, the 16th and early 17th centuries, uh, we, we don't see that. Uh, it's hard to find. And, and I think that's in part because um, the Wabanaki people were very much doing this on their own terms. They were extremely selective about contact with Europeans, uh, extremely selective about what goods and materials and technologies uh, they were adopting. Um, so this was a, a very um, different sort of playing field, um, uh, perhaps a more level playing field than what we would come to see in the wake of the wars and disease and genocide of the early 17th century. Um, so prior to the tragedies of the 17th century, the 16th century is, is a time when this, this sort of hangs in the balance um, a little bit difficult, uh, differently. Um, but it's still the beginning of a lot of those sad stories and very much the underpinning of the colonial framework of uh, the dot land today. Uh, so in that sense, it's a very important period to look at for a better understanding of the world that we inhabit today. Um, so that's all from me and uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be a part of this.